come face to face with you, the only rational thing to do is to surrender. And until we, until we, we, we get a clear picture of, of, of who our God is and the kindness of our God and the goodness of God and, and the purpose of God for us, until, until we understand that, then, then surrender will always be kept at bay. Today, my prayer is that you would show us, and some of us, you've already tasted, and you've already seen, and yet you're reluctant, and today, let it be the day where you finally fall to the knee and say, I surrender. It's not about me anymore. It's about you. Lord, would your kingdom come and would your will be done? And as we pray for your kingdom to come, it means we pray for our kingdom to go. And would you breathe upon us again? Holy Spirit, breathe on your people and breathe on your church. I pray whatever is needed, wherever there, wherever there is, is, is a hole that needs to be filled, wherever there is angst, wherever there is a crying from the depth of the soul, Holy Spirit, come in like a flood and breathe within us and fill us. And our response is yes, we surrender. Like a rushing wind, Spirit, come again. Spirit, come again. Would you make that your prayer this morning? Like a Today is a prayer of surrender as we 
pray for your kingdom to come. It means we are praying for our kingdom to go. That your kingdom would be firmly established and rooted in us. That word surrender, it's difficult because it, it, it means we're giving up something that maybe we, we've clinged to, something that brings us joy or something that just, just brings a, a measure of empowerment, whatever, whatever that looks like. And maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit's whispering to you that to, to test him in this, to surrender and let it go and let him prove to you, let him show to you that he is good and his ways are better than your own. So Holy Spirit, would you come and would you speak over us? Would you speak into us? Would you stir in us all that you have for us as we present ourselves to you, surrendered, yielded vessels? In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Reveal, how are you guys doing this morning? I am glad to see you. I'm glad that you are here. A uh, couple things uh, for you to be aware of. If you're a guest with us, I hope you received uh, an Orange Connect card. Uh, looks like this. If uh, you didn't, you can pick one up on your way out. If you did, fill it out. Drop it off at the awning on your way out. We have a little gift for you. We're glad that you're here. Uh, as our guest, pray that it is a good, hold on, because I'll get that in a second. Pray, thank you, though. Uh, pray that it is a great experience for you. Not just that you kind of hang around, it was like good, but I, I, I want you to actively be sensing the presence of God. And if, if you're new to the church thing, you may not even know what's happening. Maybe you just kind of sense something, like, like, I'm not even sure, but I'm, like something's going on inside of me. Just trust me, that, 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 is, that is God who is stirring something in you, who is speaking something in you, and I'm glad that you're here, and our prayer is that you would experience more of him while you are with us. Hey, lots of stuff inside your bulletin. I hope you received one when you came in. Uh, there is a worship night that is coming up uh, this Sunday on uh, uh, July 3rd at 7 o'clock. We're just going to kind of do a block of, of worship kind of uninterrupted. We'll have some special things going on with some scripture reading and some uh, meditative moments and things like that. I strongly encourage you to come. Listen, if you've got kids, you can bring them. Let them run around in the back. Bring them up on stage. We don't care. Let them do whatever. Uh, strongly encourage you to come out, hang out with us, even if it's for a short period of time. Uh, that'll be next Sunday night. Uh, the Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets is our Wednesday night dinner group that's taking place. It'll be about a 25-minute message, and then we will break up uh, into our table groups. We'll provide questions, and then we'll learn from one another. We'll grow from one another uh, as your tables will discuss uh, some of the topics. Now, if you're interested in that, child care is available, but you need to sign up today. We're just about at our max. I think we're at 133 that are already signed up. And so if like, you're waiting to the last minute, you may not get in. So uh, if you're interested, sign up for that. That starts on the 6th. It goes to the 10th. Uh, it's going to be a, a, great, a great time. And it gives you an opportunity to uh, meet some, some new people. If you're interested in being part of a prayer ministry uh, on Sunday to pray for people before or after service, sign up. I'll get you more information on that. VBS is around the corner. Uh, it is Mission Deep Sea. So if you have children in that age group, Sign up for that. Great opportunity for them. Some a lot of fun coming their way. And then we are in the middle of our Stock the Box program. Uh, we received several grants from the city, and we purchased a uh, trailer with it. You saw it outside. It's going to help us ramp up our homeless ministry. And so uh, if you didn't bring it today, you'll have another opportunity next Sunday. We're asking that you would bring gallon water jugs, not cases of water, but gallons of water flip-flops specifically for men, all sizes, all colors. Uh, it's a need at this time of year. And then some cleansing wipes uh, if you could help with that. So uh, that'll be taking place next week as well. Uh, if that's something that you can participate in, we'd appreciate it. All right, let me have the wonderful families come up today. Uh, always a good day. We are doing a child dedication. So some beautiful families and some beautiful children are on the way up. Go ahead all the way up on stage. All the way up. Don't be shy. And now we have the contest. All right, scrunch in a little bit. Yep, keep going. Don't fall off the stage. There you go. There you go. You guys look beautiful. 
You look beautiful. All right, let me get uh, some names here. Whoever wants to speak, give us your name and the name of your child. Uh, we'll just kind of give one. So whichever person wants to speak, just step to the... There you go. Thank you. I was waiting for someone to take the lead. My name is Larry Armendaris. Uh, this is my daughter, Legacy, Alexa, and our baby, Mateo Armendaris. Beautiful. Glad to have you with us. <laughs> I'm Vanessa, and this is Josh Carlin, and this is our son, Wyatt Carlin. What a cutie. I love your hair. Uh, my name is Nick. This is my wife, Ashley. This is Meadow Foster and Scarlett. And then I have Dean and, Dean and Dylan right next to my far right here. Glad you guys are here. Thanks. You're not too sure about being here, are you? You don't seem too happy. My name is Rachel, and this is... Olivia and Ezekiel and their father, Salvador. Excellent. Glad you guys are here. And thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christopher Atencio. This is Erica Atencio and our wonderful son, Royce James Atencio. Beautiful. I love it. All right. So um, we'll go quick because I know you got kids. And I told them, hey, if the kids start running around, it's all good. If you want to take photos, you can just come up here and do whatever you want. We're not uh, formal like that. So do whatever. Child dedication, uh, the biblical example, it comes from 1 Samuel uh, when Hannah was unable to have a child. She prayed to God, said, if you give me a child, I will dedicate this child to you uh, for all of its days. And God heard her prayer, gave her a child. She dedicated Samuel to him, and he lived a life pursuing the ways of God and doing the things of God. Uh, as we talked about, child dedication is not salvation. Right? It doesn't mean that it's, it's not a form of accepting Jesus. It's really uh, a way for you uh, as parents uh, to present your children before God, asking for grace and wisdom and how you raise your children uh, and fulfilling your parental responsibilities. Scripture gives us this challenge in Deuteronomy. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And here it is, parents. Impress them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk alongside the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols around your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Parents. It says that, that, that there is a responsibility first for you to love God and that by you loving and you pursuing Jesus, you reflect that to your children. Second, Deuteronomy makes it clear that the duty of raising your children spiritually is yours, that the church wants to help you and our children's ministry wants to help you, but the first responsibility in that is yours. And so I'm proud of you for being here today and for making that decision. So, yes. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you a challenge, and you can respond with, I do, if you do. Parents, as you stand before God and you stand before the, wis the witnesses of your church, do you commit to raising your children according to biblical, godly principles? If so, say, we do. And do you commit to being a godly example in your speech and in your lifestyle for your children to follow? If so, answer, we do. And do you commit to loving your children with an unconditional love so that they will be able to further understand and receive the love of their Heavenly Father? And if so, say, I do. As your pastor, I want you to know that I make myself available to you for whatever wisdom I can help you with, whatever way that I can assist you, I am always just a phone call away. And I sincerely mean that. Uh, we don't want you to go through this journey alone. And so uh, I make myself available to you. And let me challenge the church. Please respond with, I do. As part of Reveal, do you commit to making yourself available to these families, to pray for them, to encourage them, to share with them your experience and your wisdom as they follow God in raising their children? If so, answer, I do. And there you go. You are bound together. I now pronounce you. Uh, we won't go there. <laughs> hey, if you would join me as we pray, we bless the family, and we bless the children for all that God has for them in their future. And Lord, so we, th we take a moment and we think about that. And we think about what each life here represents. 
and the hopes and dreams that not only parents have for their children, but you have for the children. And so we want to just, we want to first thank you for the, 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 the gift of life and the, the beauty of life and, the, and the, the opportunity to be parents and to sow into these little ones. And I pray for the parents that you would empower them to do what needs to be done, that they would be at their best. And I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower them to do what they cannot do on their own. And I also ask that you would empower them that when they fail, and they will, that, that you would pick them up and they would start the journey again. Be blessed in your pursuit of all that God has for you. And then we pray for the children that all of the goodness and all of the plan and the purpose of God for their lives would be established. And we pray that they would be marked by the Holy Spirit of God, that their lives would reflect the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. And I pray that every child on this stage would become sincere, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And they would be world changers, wherever that is, whatever their portion of the world looks like, that they would be world changers. And we speak that upon them and we bless them in the journey ahead that you have. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause, will you please? Thank you, guys. You can go ahead and exit on either side there. You're not talking to a little girl at the end there. Sheila, my dear wife, we should have another baby. How's that sound? I, uh, she, I cannot repeat what you just did. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you're here. I'm 53. Can you imagine if I had a baby now? That's how it would have to raise itself. I'm just saying, there's no energy left in the tank. Well, we are uh, at the end, or almost at the end, of our current series called Asking for a Friend. Uh, and over the past six weeks, we've been asking some honest, open questions about faith, about God, about life, and some of those questions admittedly don't come with easy answers. Um, some of those questions cannot be resolved in a 25, 30 minute sermon. And so sometimes I like to give you a, a, a completed kind of package, a complete package at the end of a message, but some of the messages in this series I've kind of given you the tape and the box and uh, the bow and the wrapping paper, and you've had to do some of the work yourself, or I hope you are, that, that you had to put in a little of the work to, to pray and to think and to study and to kind of figure out where you land, which means that sometimes uh, it, it means that we have to sit in the angst and the tension of unresolved questions, right? It means that we do not dismiss difficult questions surrounding our faith, but that we lean into the tension of the unknown and the unresolved. And sometimes that means that parts of our faith is actually deconstructive because maybe we've adopted the faith of a parent or a spouse or we've never really checked into what this means about our faith. And sometimes our faith needs to be stripped down before the Spirit can rebuild it. And so my advice to you is don't avoid the questions. Don't avoid the tension. If your faith is hanging by a thread, my suggestion is you pull it. And then you sit in the tension, gather some people around you, study, pray, engage in dialogue, and allow your faith to begin to be reconstructed. Now, next week, we're going to close this thing out on what might be a controversial message, depending where you land on the topic, uh, asking for a friend, why would a loving God send someone to hell? And we're going to set aside what we think we know. We're going to set aside what we've seen in movies or what you've read in Dante's Inferno, and we're going to allow Scripture to speak for itself. We're going to, we're going to look at this idea of what it is. Maybe, maybe some of what you think you know isn't really based in Scripture. We're going, to, we're going to really kind of dive into this. Now, you should also know that next week's message will be rather long, so long that you may feel like you're in... Yeah, okay, so... Now, today, I'm joking, it won't be that long. Some of you are like, not coming next week. <laughs> today, we're looking at possibly the most important question we can ask. We're, we're asking the question, why Jesus? If a family member or a friend approached you this week and in all sincerity said, T -t -t tell me why, make a case, why, why Jesus? 
with all of the other multiple religious options that are before us today, right? The world is smaller than ever before. What sets Jesus apart? First Peter says that, that we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So how would you answer the question, why Jesus? And if the only thing you have in your tool belt is the Bible says, in today's culture, that's probably not going to be a very compelling argument. Right? It may carry weight with a Christ follower, but the first thing a person who is not of faith is going to ask is, well, how do we know what the Bible says about Jesus is true? I mean, how reliable is it? Was, wasn't the story of Jesus just kind of written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus? And didn't the story of Jesus just kind of evolve over time and embellishing the story a little at a time to where a picnic lunch for 50 eventually evolved into a community lunch for 500? And a walk on the beach evolved into walking on water. I mean, how, how, do we, how do we answer the question, why Jesus? And, and do you have a compelling reason for why you say the Bible says? Because let's face it, we're going we're gonna to build our case from the Bible, but do you have a compelling reason why you believe the Bible? Or is it just, well, the Bible says, and that's good enough for me? Because it may be good enough for you, but the person who is exploring faith, it, faith it's not going to be good enough for them. And so we need to have some kind of preparation, some answer that goes beyond the phrase the Bible says. See, I think the Bible somewhat removes us, or the phrase the Bible says, somewhat removes us from what the Bible is, right? It, it, it takes the Gospels, for example, which the Gospels tell us about the life and ministry of Jesus, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, understand they were not originally written to be the Bible, Right? It was just the, the account of four different perspectives, men who wrote from either their experience firsthand or what they have heard from people who were eyewitnesses. And so the Bible says it can almost distance us from what the Gospels are, a historical account written from four different perspectives. So really the question should be maybe not, is the Bible reliable? Perhaps the question should be, is Matthew reliable? Is Mark reliable? Is Luke reliable? And is John reliable? Because, because now, well, first understand, we, we, we cannot prove this with undeniable evidence, right? The authors are not here where we can interview them. But, but, but can we take a critical investigation of ancient records that make up the Bible? And will it add reliability to the text? Will it cause us to lean in one way or another, e either towards credibility or towards fallacy, towards truth or towards myth, toward Lord or toward legend? So I, I want us to move away just, just for a minute. We're going we're gonna to pin the phrase, the Bible says, right? In that the only reason the Bible is the Bible is because people chronicled what they experienced, and now those documents are in the Bible, so what I'm suggesting is that we approach the documents that make up the Bible, right? The four historical documents, especially that we call the Gospels. And we treat them as we would any other historical document, that we would think critically about them, that we would kick the tires, right? right? Let's, let, let's look at the authors and, and what they are saying. Are there documents to be taken seriously? And in turn, should Jesus be taken seriously? Because if even one of the gospel writers has this right, it's game on. Right? It, it changes everything. Now, let's pray as we're going to jump in and see what the Lord has for us. Hey, um, someone check that AC. It's uh, freezing up here. I don't know if anyone else is, but uh, it's, it's cold. Lord, uh, as we uh, inspect your word, we pray that you would come speak to us as we uh, look critically, as we use the minds that you've given us. I pray that through that you would, you would build our faith, you would strengthen our faith in what it is that you have to say to us. So Holy Spirit, come. Come. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is only the Bible because something happened worth writing about. Right? As it, as it pertains to the Gospels, we would say that there was an event 
right, that, that occurred. It was the cross. It was the resurrection. And that event rallied people around it. And those people turned into a movement or a gathering or an assembly. Later, it would be called the church. Now, somewhere in the first century, the movement, or people in the movement, began to document the event, right? And then 300 years later, now we're fourth century, 300 years later, the documents were assembled in what we now call the Bible. Now, now catch this. This is important. The story of Jesus is not a Bible story. Jesus does not exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of Jesus, right? Here's what I mean. If there was no event, if there was no resurrection, right, if then, then there would be no movement because there was no event for people to rally around. If there was no movement because there was no event, then there would be no documentation of said event, Right? There, there would be no movement because we know that the disciples, they scattered during the crucifixion. They went underground. They were in fear. If there's no event, there's no movement. And if there's no movement, there's nothing to tell. So there's nothing documented. Right? Something happened that got the band back together. And these individuals, people of the movement, began to document the event. It caused ordinary people to begin to chronicle what actually happened. So a guy named Luke, he said it this way. Luke 1, he said, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Other translations say of the things that have taken place among us. In other words, what he's saying is everyone, many, are talking about the event, right? It's not just me. Many people are working on a narrative. Luke Luke wanted his readers to know that I'm not the only person doing this, right? Something happened that was special enough that many people now are working on the same thing that I'm working on. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would many people go through the effort to chronicle the life of Jesus? If nothing happened, then Jesus just becomes this crazy guy who claimed to be the Messiah, and he wasn't the first who claimed to be the Messiah. So something had to happen in order to gather a movement around an event that caused them to chronicle the events surrounding the movement. In other words, ask yourself this. How many many will take the time to write about your life? And the answer is not as in not many, right? That, that's what the answer is. Right? Not many are going to take the time to, to, to write about you because there's probably, for most of us in this room, there's probably not going to be a lot to tell. But something happened that caused a movement to chronicle the event that gathered the movement. But this is important. Back to Luke. I'm not the only one doing this. Many are doing the same thing. Luke was not writing the Bible. All right, Luke did not have that in his mind. He was, he was writing a narrative. He was recording events. That's why I say maybe the better question is not, is the Bible reliable, but is Luke reliable? Because the Bible is what the, the, the uh, documents of Luke, as they are written, something happened that compelled him and others to write about what they heard and what some heard and saw firsthand. Why would anyone take the time to to take the time to write a narrative about a a poor Jewish carpenter from a podunk town like Bethlehem. Why so many? The answer is because something happened that caught the attention of first century Palestine and somebody had to tell the story. Luke goes on. Many have undertaken to complete a narrative of the things that have been accomplished. Notice what he says. Among us. In other words, hey, this is an ancient history. This isn't something that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? He's he's writing very close to the event. So he says, this has happened among us. These things occurred right here in our own backyard, right? Later, other other writers say, you actually experienced this for yourself. He goes on to say, 
Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered to us. In other words, he's saying, what I'm about to pass on to you was passed down from those who lived it. Right? It's not witnesses three and four generations away from the event. Right? I, I got this from the source is what he's saying. And then he goes on with this in mind. Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Right? In other words, I didn't throw this together just to complete the assignment. A lot of work went into this. Now, now, I understand this doesn't prove anything, but you also need to understand that it's very difficult to prove any ancient document that we have. Like things that we know about Alexander the Great were written 400 years after his life. It's very difficult to prove that because of the limited text that we have on him. And so we, we run into the same issue with biblical text because the author isn't here to interview that we run into with any text of ancient history throughout antiquity. And then Luke even gives the name of the person he does the research for. He says, right, I've carefully investigated this. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Listen, Luke was not writing the Bible. He was recording the events that captured the attention of first century Palestine. And if someone would have gone to Luke and said, hey, guess what? 2,000 plus years later, a group of people from the land of El Mirage will be reading your narrative. He would have said, you're crazy. Because I'm just writing this down for my friend Theophilus. Right? I'm, I'm, just, I'm gathering this for him and maybe a, a few other people. It's good for myself. But if you really think me, if you think I should believe that, that 2,000 years later, my document will still be in circulation. And people from this mystical land of El Mirage are reading it. You are crazy. But that is exactly what happened. 300 years later, right, it was added to this thing called the Bible. In other words, Luke's narrative is not reliable because it's in the Bible. Luke's narrative is in the Bible because it was deemed reliable at the time it was written. And so that, that's what I mean, that this phrase, well, the Bible says it almost, it almost minimizes what the Bible is. And so I want us to begin to look at Scripture. I would encourage you to look at Scripture through the lens of the authors. Is Paul a reliable author in what he has to say? Are the gospel writers a reliable source? And then Luke tells us why he put in all the work. For Theophilus, he says, hey, that you may have certainty concerning the things that have been taught. Listen, if Luke's account is correct, it changes everything. But it's not just Luke's account. There's three other accounts. Right? Three others chronicled the event. Two of them claimed to be eyewitnesses that we lived with Jesus. We, we participated in the ministry. So it comes down to this. Can we trust their account? Are they reliable? And what reasons do we have to think that their narrative is true? See, as we're taking a critical look and investigating the work of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we'll kind of hover in the Gospels. We have two choices. They are either true or they are false. That's all I have for you. Let's pray. We'll close. All right. So, no, they are true or they are false. Now, if they're false, there are two possibilities. They could be false because they are intentionally false, right? Someone deliberately or intentionally fabricated a lie, and we'll call this the lie hypothesis. Or if, uh, uh, if their account is a lie, it can be unintentional. Right? Maybe, maybe they, they, they didn't do it on purpose, but it, it's an unintentional lie. That the authors were entirely sincere, but not rooted in reality. Right? They, they believed what they wrote, but they were deceived. They were conned by a charlatan, or maybe their stories were embellished over time and, uh, until a man who preached about love suddenly became the man who claimed to be God. And we'll call this the legend hypothesis that just kind of grew and grew over time. But those are our two choices. If you're going to land on the side of it being false, it was either written as a known lie or it was written by people who were kind of deceived and it just kind of fell into this legend, this category of legend, over time. So let's take the time we have left. Let's tackle the lie and the legend hypothesis to maybe give us some, some, some weight when someone asks, why Jesus? That we can say more than just because the Bible says. Let's look at the lie hypothesis. First, I think to pull off a lie of this magnitude, magnitude to me, 
it's just impractical. And let, let me tell you what I mean. It's not a story set in the distant past, at least when the lie would have been birthed, right? It's not a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Fabricating a story like this would have been much easier if you said, hey, this happened 300 years ago. Because the eyewitnesses or the associates of the eyewitnesses, they would have been dead. And they can no longer refute your story. There, there, there's very little time between the event and the first uh, records or, or narratives that we begin to see throughout history. Paul's letters, for example, they're dated from the 50s, not the 1950s, right? From the real 50s. And some would even say maybe a little earlier than that. That means that, that there, we're talking 20 years from the event to when Paul started to write. That's a very short time in historical terms. And the closer the source is to the event, the more reliable we would say the source is. That's just not for Scripture. That's for anything, any type of, of, of ancient article, ancient documents, right? The people named in the stories were still alive. And so it would be easy to say, that's not how it happened. The authors of the New Testament, they drop well-known names like Pilate and Herod and Joseph of Arimathea, who was part of the Sanhedrin, was like, be kind of like our Supreme Court, and Caiaphas, who was a high priest. And if you're creating a lie, you don't write in big-name people who can easily say, that's not how it happened. It doesn't make sense. Right? Why would you name people, and these are people that we know existed in history, why would you write them into your story if you're creating a lie? Listen, when my children were younger and they tried to lie to me, the moment they brought their siblings into the lie, like so-and-so knows too, it becomes that much easier to debunk the story because under the pressure of punishment, siblings turn on one another. Right? And so, so for them to kind of name the, these other people, it becomes easier to debunk the story. In other words, this lie was not held by one individual. It was, it, it, if it was a lie, it was much bigger than that. For a lie of this magnitude to be sustained, the base of those participating in the lie would have had to be deep and wide. Right? There had to be be hundreds of people possibly who were involved in. Let, let, let's just say that Jesus was involved in the lie, right? Let's say he was a con man and he was, he, he was involved in the lie. Do we think that Jesus recruited a few of his friends? Let's say he grabbed Peter and Andrew. He said, guys, I've called you here for the first ever Operation Deceive the World meeting. I'm glad you're here. And then he says, guys, here's the thing. Peter, Andrew, uh, I brought you here today because I had this crazy dream last night. <laughs> it's crazy. And I need your help. All right, so, so, so here's the plan. I'm going to claim to be God. Okay? All right, so follow me. All right? Now, step two, I need you two to identify 10 other people who will play along with the lie. All right, Peter, that's your job. All right, start looking. We need a total of 12, and we're going to call them my disciples. And once we have them secure, we're going to take our show on the road. Now, Andrew, this is important. I need you to go down to the market and find some people who want to make a buck who are willing to lie and say that they're healed when I pray for them. Okay, so, Andrew, you need to go do that and make sure they're sworn to secrecy, all right? Pay them well if you need to. All right, now, now once, once the word begins to spread, here's where it gets good, guys. I'm going to get the attention of the Pharisees, and they're going to hate me. And then I'm going to trick them into killing me. <laughs> it's awesome, right? I'm going to trick them into killing me, and after I'm dead, three days after I'm dead, you guys will begin to spread a rumor that you saw me. It's kind of like a weekend at Bernie's thing, and they're like, who's Bernie? He's like, never mind, Right? <laughs> Right? You're going to spread the word that, that, that you saw me, right? And, and you're going to be like, hey, I saw him swimming down at the river. And they're like, Jesus, you don't know how to swim. He's like, good point. Uh, tell them that you saw me somewhere else then. Right? And they, they begin to build this thing. Then he says, but here's the other part. I'm going to need you to recruit four other guys to write a fictitious biography about me. And tell them to pour it on thick. Stuff like healings and miracles and raising the dead and walking on water. And tell them to work in some of that scary stuff about demons because people love that stuff, right? right? So you're going to need to find some people. Pour it on thick. And, and now here's the hardest part, okay? Gather around. Gather around. Someone's going to need to convince my mother 
to play along. All right, so someone's going to need, need to kind of get her on board. That's going to be difficult because, because she's stubborn. But if mom's not on board, she's going to be telling everyone, my son is certifiably crazy. So we need to get my mother to play along, and not just my mother. We need to get my brother James on board, too. The more family that can be part of this lie, the better. Now, now here's the final part of the plan. We're, we're going to need you to deceive large groups of people that will become an ecclesia, an assembly, a church, right? And once all the pieces are put into place, just let, we're going we're to let it simmer. Or you're going to let it simmer because I'll be dead, right? right? And slowly, little by little, the story will spread and sweep through the entire Roman Empire, jump the ocean, and, and, and influence the entire world. And then there's this awkward pause. And pre- Peter breaks the silence. He says... Um, uh, Jesus, just curious, uh, what's in it for us? And Jesus says, well, you're going to be killed <laughs> brutally, okay? <laughs> killed, br- I mean bad. But here's the thing. You can't break under the pressure. You're going to have to take it to the grave. Now, <laughs> who's in? <laughs> like, I, I don't see a lot of people beating down the door and saying, that sounds awesome. I have nothing to do next weekend anyways. Let's go. Right? It, it, just, it just seems odd to me to pull off a lie like this. It seems improbable. Here's another thought. If, it, if it's a lie, what's the motive? To prove something in court, there has to be a motive. What is the motive of the lie? Right? No one got rich off of it. It's not like they, they, they uh, assembled a large harem and pots of gold and a fleet of camels. It's not like they were living the good life. They were all martyred. For their faith, right? They were persecuted. Who makes up a story that, that not only puts themselves in jeopardy, but their families in jeopardy? First century Judaism, if you make a claim that flesh and blood is God, and you stand by that claim, you're booted out of the community, right? You're, 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 you're a heretic. Not only you, but, but your family suffers for it. Who is willingly going to place themselves and their families in that situation for a known lie? Now, We can speculate and say, well, maybe the motive was to assemble a group of people who would eventually rise up and shake off Roman oppression. Now, this is a valid hypothesis, right? Because the Jews were waiting for a deliverer, for a Messiah, for a Redeemer that would step in and rise up and create this countercultural movement that would go against Rome and finally break the chains of Roman oppression. Because the Jewish history is someone always was above them, whether it was the Romans, the Greek, the Assyrians, or the Babylonians. And so they were waiting for a Messiah to bring freedom, right? A deliverer. So there is the possibility of that, right? They lied so they could gather enough momentum to finally overthrow Roman oppression. Here's the problem with that. What they wrote or what they documented does not back that narrative. Matter of fact, it's the opposite of that narrative, right? It moves the Jewish narrative, overthrow Rome, in the wrong direction. That's why when they ask questions like, Jesus, is now the time that, that, you, that you establish your kingdom and we break free? He's like, mm, that's not why I'm here. And they wrote those things. And so if, if they were lying to gather a movement to, 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 to begin to create this countercultural move that would upend Rome, the gospel writers wrote in the wrong direction, right? They, 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 they write things like, you know, Jesus was not here to break them free from the bondage of Rome. It was to break them free from the bondage of sin. There is nothing in any of the New Testament documents that promotes Jesus as a freedom fighter to rise people up to break free from Rome. And so if that was their motive, they certainly didn't write that way. And so there doesn't seem to be a motive for all of this. Third one, no early critic accused Jesus or the disciples or any other New Testament author from making this up or from lying. Now, now, the Jewish authorities viewed it as a movement that was a cult or heresy that needed to be squashed, right? Roman authorities saw it as a nuisance, but we don't have anything suggesting that they were lying. And then the the fourth one, no record of anyone, uh, there's no record of anyone cracking under the pressure, right? Torture has a way of bringing out the truth, or at least saying what needs to be said in order to stop the pain. We have no record of either, right? 
If someone in upper management broke and admitted the entire story was made up, the authorities would have paraded them through the city streets as a way of saying, see, it's all a lie. Right? There, there's nothing to see here. There's no credibility here. Now, now, none of this proves that it wasn't a lie, right? We, we can't prove that undeniably, right? Uh, because the authors are not here. But it does kind of begin to lean us toward the way of thinking that the lie hypothesis is, is rather difficult to support. Matter of fact, most historians and scholars would say this was not written as an intentional lie. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means that most historians would say it wasn't written as an as, as, as a, a intentional falsehood. But we're still left with the other side. We're still left with the other possibility. That is, the New Testament, if the New Testament documents are false, not intentionally, but they could be false unintentionally. That the authors were sincere in what they wrote, but they got carried away by the hype, and the Jesus story was embellished over the years. Now, if you're going to reject the Christian faith, I would use this one, right? Because at least it carries some water. And at least it holds a little merit. The lie stuff, that one's difficult. And like I said, scholars and, and historians would, 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 say the same, would stay the same. So let's, let's unpack this. Is this a legend that grew over time? Or can the New Testament writers be trusted? Here's the legend hypothesis. I think it's improbable that first century Jews would have promoted a Messiah legend like we see in the New Testament. Uh, we talked a little bit about that already, but every culture you know has legends, and those myths and legends serve a purpose, right? Th those who study these things would, would tell you the same, that, that legend and myth is crucial to imparting vital information or life lessons. They actually reinforce the fabric of society, um, and they reinforce beliefs and values and conviction, especially when they are being opposed by culture. And so myth and legend, they actually serve a purpose in that culture. Now, if first century Jews were to create a, a, a Jesus legend, it would not have looked anything like what we read in the New Testament. Right? As I said, it's the antithesis of what the Jewish belief system was. For example, the message of Jesus was, you're doing it all wrong. Right? The way that you're practicing your faith is no longer valid. That is not a legend that first century Jews would have gotten behind. But that was the message of Jesus. Right? The, the, the idea of a crucified Messiah is not an idea that first century Jews would have promoted. It wouldn't have been a legend that would have grew from them. I mean, this idea that God can be crucified on a tree, especially a, a death of cursed crucifixion, it, it, just, it just would not have happened. It's not the way a legend would have evolved. What about this one? The New Testament documents depict Jesus as being God with full authority. The Jewish narrative was that the Messiah would come anointed by God, but wouldn't be God. And so for Jesus to claim to be God would, again, would not be a narrative that, that a first century Jewish people would have gotten behind to allow that, that legend to continue to grow. If a legend was to evolve out of this culture, it would most certainly support a Jewish narrative and a Jewish belief structure. It would reinforce the Jewish values, and that's nothing that we see in the New Testament. So it's difficult to say, well, this was just a legend that kind of grew over time, at least a legend that would have grown out of a, a Jewish belief structure, right? Jews worshiped one God, and that was the narrative. Now, here's another one. Uh, Greg Boyd uh, said this, that Judaism in the first century was not conducive to legends of this nature. Uh, Boyd wrote numerous books on this, uh, much of this material is take, taken from him. Um, now, Gentiles would have bought into this because Gentiles were up for anything. Gentiles were non-Jews, right? They, they were pagan in nature. They had all kinds of gods, all kinds of deities. And when they found a god that they thought could help them, they just added them to their god stew. And so Gentiles, they, they would be up for anything. But Jews were monotheistic, right? They, they were doing everything they could to distance themselves from Gentiles. That's why they did not like each other. Jews believed that there was one God and would have fiercely resisted a legend of this, uh, of this form because they would say, well, we're nothing like the Gentiles. 
We have one God and only one God, right? Twice a day, they would recite the, recite the, the Shema, the oldest fixed daily prayer in Judaism. It was the centerpiece of their morning and evening prayers. And how does it start? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. They would have never been promoting this idea that way. So there's another God. Jesus, this guy in the flesh, he, he's God too. It just wouldn't have happened. A faithful first century Jew in Palestine would not have been an easy mark to flippantly assign divinity upon flesh and blood. And yet we know that there are numerous Jewish converts to the faith. Matter of fact, they were the largest demographic in the early church. The Gentiles were added later. Something caused them to flip. And it would not have been an easy task. Even Pharisees, we know, flipped. So what, what, what happened there? A legend, as it is told in the New Testament, I think it would have a hard time evolving in this environment. While we can't prove it, first century Judaism, it's just the wrong environment with the wrong culture, the wrong people for uh, a story, a legend like this to continue to evolve. Here's another one. There's not enough time for the legend to develop. Now again, people that study this thing would tell you that, that it takes uh, typically hundreds of years for these legends to begin to develop. And like I said, we have, we have documents that are 20, 80 years away from the event. It doesn't mean that it's not possible for this legend to have happened in that short of time. It just means that it's very improbable, right? Myths and legend take time to grow. And for the legend of Jesus to grow in such a short period of time, it would have required a growth rate that is implausibly high, right? Legend requires stories to be told and retold and retold, repeated thousands and thousands, thousands of times. Each time there's a slight variation in what was said until it finally becomes legend in, in what the, the, the culture knows it to be. We just don't see that with, with the plethora of New Testament documentations we have. Again, doesn't mean it's true. It just means it is highly unlikely that it was just something that happened over several hundred years. And that's a big, that's a big pushback that many people will say, well, the Bible was written 400 years after Jesus, and so it was just kind of evolved into this legend of, of what you guys say is God. But if you back up the documentation, people who were just writing the narrative of what they heard and what they saw, it's really difficult to say that. You'd have to say the legend formed within sometimes 20 years, as, as early as 20 years, and that's just improbable, right? The letters from Paul are 20, 30 years after the event. Look at it this way. Buddha lived 2,600 years ago, right? Um, my brother, he's a little plumper than I am. He used to say he had the body of a god, Buddha. You can use that one, right? right? He kind of had a belly. No, not good? Okay. All right, let's close in prayer. You're not going to laugh at my stuff. I have time for you. All right, moving right on. So, Buddha lived 2,600 years ago. He claimed no inspiration from God, no external power, did not claim to be God. And yet we know that over a 500-year span, there was a segment of his followers that then worshipped him as God. Right? It took 500 years for the legend to evolve, for him to, to, to be seen as divinity. Right? In other words, again, it just kind of shows that, 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 that legends of this nature, they just don't happen over time. If what we have is a Jesus legend, it didn't form over 500 years or even 50 years because we see that the disciples are immediately proclaiming the resurrection. We, we have it in text 20, 50, you know, 70, 80 years away from the event. In historical terms, that's a very short time. Right? And what do we do about the half-brother of Jesus, who also, we know, was a key uh, pillar in the early church. Now, Scripture tells us in John 7 that his brothers did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Because who's going to believe your brother, your sister, is God, right? What would your brother or your sister have to do to prove to you that they are divine? Something happened that convinced Jesus' brother that Jesus was who he claimed to be. An event of some sort, so large that your brother or your sister would have to say, you know what, I believe it. And James became a pillar of the early church. Here's another one. The Gospels read like sober history, not legend, right? 
That, that, that's just not the way that they read. The New Testament is far too specific for it to be legend, right? Names are dropped, locations are given that align with history. I started off the message saying Pilate, Herod, Joseph of Arimathea, and Caiaphas, they're all named, right? That's sober history. That's not legend. Listen to what Mark says. Mark's gospel says, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, very specific, the father of Alexander and Rufus, very specific, was passing on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, why would Mark use a specific name like this unless he thought that his readers would know who he was referring to? Right? I wouldn't go to you and say, um, um, my, my, my father, uh, you know, uh, the, he's, he's the brother of, of, of blah, 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 because you wouldn't know him. There's a reason why Mark said, hey, he is the father of, of these other two guys, right, Alexander and Rufus, because he believed that his first century audience reading this would have made the connection. That is very specific for it to be legend, right? Time for legend to form. It just doesn't seem like it was there, and it's far too specific. And then also we see in the, the New Testament that there are counterproductive details that actually hurt the story. For example, if you're writing a legend, you would probably write yourself in as the hero, but the disciples wrote themselves in as boobs, right? They were always messing up. They were always low of faith. Jesus was always saying, how long do I have to be with you? How many times do I have to explain this to you? He rebuked Peter by saying, get behind me, Satan. If I'm writing a narrative of my life, I'm probably leaving that part out. But they write in things that are counterproductive to the story, right? They talk about, right, it's written in that they were powerless over a guy who had a demon. Why would you write that if you're either making it up or you're forming a legend? You would say, yeah, we went in and we looked at that guy and we snapped our fingers and the demon came out. That's not what they say, right? They're hiding in fear after the crucifixion. If you're making up a story that's going to be embellished over time to become legend status, you write yourself in as the hero, and yet women in the story are written in as key witnesses, the first to see the resurrection. This is not something you would write first century if, if you were making this up to be a legend. Women's testimony was not allowed in court unless they were accompanied by a man. So why would you make women to be the very first to see the risen Messiah? It doesn't make sense. Why write in these counterproductive things if you're creating a legend? And the possibility, at least in my mind, one strong possibility could be the reason they wrote it like this is because this is how the event happened. This is what they saw. This is what they experienced. And then also we see that the Gospels give evidence of being written by eyewitness testimonies uh, or, or at least passed on by eyewitnesses, and me, meaning it doesn't, it doesn't give this idea that it, was, that it was written several hundred years beyond the event. Listen to what John said, First John. Count how many times God, John reiterates what they have seen and what they have heard. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, there it is, right? Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, Jesus. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was from the Father and has appeared to us. And we proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship with is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And then verse 5, this is the message we have heard. It, it just doesn't read like, like, like legend, right? It's, it's very specific. It reinforces we've seen it, we've heard it, our hands have touched it, we lived it with, 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 with our own experience, and now we're passing it on to you. Now listen, none of this is undeniable proof. You will never have undeniable proof. 
right? You, you can't. The authors who wrote it are not around. We cannot, we cannot cross-examine them, right? But all we can do is to take a step back and say, is what, is what is written, if we look at it through any other historical document, can we be fairly certain that it is credible, that it's not written as a lie, and that it's not written as legend? And if it's not a lie of, uh, uh, of an unintentional lie, And if it's not an uh, an intentional lie, if it's not a lie and if it's not legend, then we have to lean towards the side of truth. And if if it is true, then it's game on and we have a really serious decision to make, right? If the gospel writers especially are credible, if Paul is a reliable source, we have a decision to make. It means that there is truth that is greater than all truth and his name is Jesus, Within the historical documents contained in this thing we call the Bible is really the words of life. It's where we find the meaning of life. And what it communicates to you and to me is that you are fiercely loved. So much so that God would send himself, his son, to redeem you back to him. Now the question you should be thinking, well, if all this is the case then why do scholars believe the New Testament documents are legend? And there's one reason. Miracles. The the, the only reason why scholars and historians take the the New Testament documents, right, which chronicles the life of, of, of Jesus, and the reason why they slide it over to the legend category is because there are supernatural events events that cannot be explained. And the event that we rally around is the resurrection of a dead person. Now, admittedly, those are difficult hurdles to get over. But if we're talking about a God who created everything, if we're talking about the divine, then wouldn't you want there to be some power, some, some, some muscle behind the hustle? Or, or, or are you just looking for a God that says, oh, you're sick? No, that's a bummer. I think, I think you would expect it. Look, look. The idea... The Bible says, it, I'm not down on it, it, it it's, it's good, it may be good for you, but if, if you can present some, some, some deeper critical thinking on what the Bible says, you may have a much more engaging conversation with someone who's asking you, why Jesus? Why, with, with all the plethora of other options, why does Jesus matter? And if you come to the conclusion that the Gospels and the New Testament leans towards truth, and that what they say about Jesus is truth, then you have a decision to make. And it's not just adding the Jesus that they chronicle into the pot of stew that is your other deities, which was the common practice first century especially with Gentiles, when when they would find another god or when Rome would conquer another land and there was a god there that that seemed appealing, they would say, hey, we kind of like that. We're taking it for ourselves. And so there would just be deity upon deity. Whatever deity would would do what you needed it to do, you would adopt that deity as your own. It's very common uh, in in parts of India and and, in that that, uh, area for Hinduism. Right? There's all kinds of God. They're open to you praying for them in the name of Jesus if Jesus is the God that's going to bless them. But Jesus says, hey, into a culture that says, we'll just add you to the mini. Jesus says, you cannot put new wine into an old wineskin. In other words, he's saying, you cannot add me into what you already have. You're going to have to get rid of all of it. And you're going to need a new container to hold what I'm about to pour into you. And the way you get that new container is you surrender and I'll make you that new container. Look, today, I don't know where you're at. But to me, when you look at what Scripture says, the next logical step is surrender. The next logical step is to say, I'm going to spend some time pursuing you. I'm going to get myself out of the way. I'm going to put you on the throne of my life. I'm going, to, I'm going to seek for this idea of forgiveness of sin. I'm going to ask for it, and then I'm going to receive it, and then I'm going to start to move my life down a different path. As you fill me, new wine, the metaphor, into a new wineskin. Maybe you've never thought about it before, but my hope, my hope 
is that your faith can be a little more anchored when you step out of the Bible says and look at it for what it is. Documents by men who chronicled events that happened. And the event was big enough that someone had to tell it. And now it's your turn to tell it. Pray with me, Lord. Um, I pray that maybe our faith can be a little more anchored today, can be a little more sure today, that, that we can look at, at what is in Scripture and uh, maybe we can take more of a critical eye to it and that, and that it, it would be encouraging to us that, that our, our faith would almost like it has a, a fresh breath breathed into it, that, that Holy Spirit, you would stir yourselves in us and that, that yes, we, we, we believe the Bible says, but the reason why we believe the Bible says is that you inspired these people to chronicle what was happening. And you inspired them so that we may be certain of the things we have heard. And so today my prayer is for anyone, maybe for the first time, who is investigating this idea of faith, that they would come to a point of saying yes, at least, yes, that I will continue the investigation. I will continue exploring what this is all about. And my prayer is that we would all get to a point where we surrender ourselves and say, more of you and less of us, come in and, and, and forgive me of my sin, make me a new being, a new wineskin, as it were, and then fill me with your presence more and more of your presence, and then make me a vessel that repeats the story of life that is found in Jesus Christ. That is my prayer for you, church, because we have a job to do to carry the story forward. And so I bless you in that. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Amen. Hey, Reveal, God bless you next week. We'll tackle the difficult topic of hell. I hope you're here for that. God bless you. Sign up in the bulletin for anything that you need to sign up for. I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.